before I introduce our speaker today, just a reminder that uh, questions or queries should be uh, delivered to me, the chair, through the Q&A format, and we will deal with them at the end of the seminar. Uh, so today, um, and again, I uh, give a thanks to um, Papa Lowe for the recommendation of Lisa as our speaker today. Uh, Lisa is a senior lecturer in social sciences at Edge Hill University in the United Kingdom. She has a PhD in environmental policy implementation and local knowledge. She's currently completing a book project on narrating childhood and youth uh, across contexts. Uh, for her seminar today, Lisa is going to be talking about joint work she is doing with a colleague, Lorraine Green, uh, on an exploratory study of work practice and emotions of veterinarians in Ireland and the UK. So Lisa, without further ado, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Doran, uh, for such um, kind words. And also to um, my colleague, Dr. Patrick Malone, who I know for several years in NUI Galway, and also to Doran um, for pursuing the the invitation um, as well. So as Darren said, I'm Lisa Morin and I'm a senior lecturer in social science at the Department of Social Sciences in Edgehill University in Ormskirk, Lancashire. And I've actually just uh, published that book, uh, Darren, um, that you spoke about uh, with Paul Grave Macmillan, working with two colleagues from NUI Galway, Dr. Bernadine Brady and uh, Dr. Um, Cathy Riley. So Lorraine and I have been doing this work for on and off about a year and a half. This is very much exploratory work. Um, we've presented this at a couple of conferences, including the European Sociological Association. Um, but before the, the session started today, Darren and I were actually talking about how much we, we both miss conferences and the interaction. So it's lovely being in this space. Um, and this work really emerged very much from a mutual and a shared interest that we both have in emotion and in biographical research. And I identify very strongly as a biographical researcher. I have a very strong interest in narrative-based methods uh, through some of the work that I did with Bernadine and Cathy, and also with my colleagues, uh, Professor Maggie O'Neill and uh, Dr. Ludmilla Nurse in Oxford University um, as well, and pursuing some work um, with them at the moment. We also have a very strong interest in the notion of the life course. And Lorraine has published a really seminal book, Understanding the Life Course, which brings together sociological and also psychological approaches to understanding um, what the life course is. And as Darren said, my own PhD study was very much based around the knowledge of farmers in Connemara and farming communities. And it was very much based methodologically around the whole idea of death interviewing and around using um, different types of narrative approaches, maybe more generalized narrative approaches with um, environmental policy makers as well in Brussels and in the Irish context and with people um, in the EPA. Um, I followed on with that in my career. I was a postdoctoral researcher on Icon, Icon Map, um, which was a study of Yone's disease with some colleagues at the School of Veterinary Medicine in UCD, including Professor Michael Doherty and Dr. Connor McAloon. And that was also um, a work that we did with Chagask in Athenry and Dr. Anya McInwalsh. And within the context of this, I got the expertise in using the biographical narrative interpretive method. And I'm now the chair of um, a, a study group on biographies, life course, and narrative research methods with the Sociological Association of Ireland. So Lorraine and I very much had this shared interest around emotions and the life course. We were also hired on the very same day in Edge Hill. They started off with one job and they liked two of us and they ended up <clears throat> hiring two of us um, on the one day, which was fantastic. And we formed this research collaboration around young people are in, that are in the care system, which was other biographical work um, that I did in NUI Galway, work that Lorraine did. She was a child protection social worker as well um, in the past. And we talked initially about our interest in vets and in animals. And both Lorraine and I are very much animal lovers. And I was teaching a group of PhD students yesterday in Galway about the significance of projects just emerging very much by chance, very organically, um, from just shared conversations that you have. It might be in a corridor, for example. So I have a very strong um, connection to rural places and a very strong 
feeling, I suppose, of, of being in place or a very strong sense of belonging in rural Ireland. And I also have experience as a dog owner since 1998. Now, this might sound quite touchy feely, but the realm of emotions is something that um, is very much something that we explore in the context of our research, both in the work on touch and silence um, with Dr. Lisa Warwick at the University of Nottingham with children in care, but also in the context um, of, of this study. So Lorraine has a very strong interest, as I said, in life course research. She also came at this as a pet owner. And these type of positionalities that we, we, we talked about in relation not only to our professional backgrounds as sociologists and as biographical and narrative researchers, but also what we were bringing to the table in terms of our understandings of animals and the shared interest that we had in human animal um, interaction. And one of the, the things I think that brought Lorraine around to the whole idea of doing the project was we were both unfortunately had experienced pet, pet um, euthanasia. And this inspired a lot of questions within both of us around the emotional labor of vets in relation to self-management and emotional expression. And this was something that we saw in Icon Map with farmers previously, and also in um, biographical work that I did with young people that were in the care system. And how particular types of devices, I would call them like humor, for example, was used by some of these young people to deflect attention, in my view, from very, very deep experiences of trauma, including emotional and sexual abuse. So sometimes, um, I suppose in the past, because my experience is very broad in terms of the research that I do, um, it's often in some respects, I think, when I look at my CV, I think, how are these things all connected? When in essence they are, and they're connected with a very deep appreciation of storytelling and wanting to, to tell people stories and wanting to engage in the process of storytelling. So, in the early days, um, Lorraine uh, told me, for instance, that um, she felt very much that when she was in this type of space as a pet owner and her beloved cat Bo was, uh, was given back to her, he was unfortunately had to be euthanized. And she felt that there was something going on with the nurse that in fact, it was very much a scripted event. You know, that she said she was sorry on four occasions, but actually Lorraine didn't feel that the nurse was in fact um, sorry for the loss. And I had a very different experience when I had to put down my beloved sheepdog, um, Brandy. I actually felt that the vet did feel sorry for what he was doing and that there was a sense of loss because the vet had built up a strong relationship with us as pet owners, but also um, with the dog who had been in the, the surgery in Mayo for long periods of time. So we started to ask, where does self-management um, where does it fit within all of this? And we were very much inspired by the work of Arlie Huckshield um, and her work, for example, in relation to emotion. And I suppose emotion, as we know, is something that has risen in prominence in sociology, you know, over the past um, 10 to 15 years. And in fact, even longer since Huckshield's um, initial work was, was, um, was written on air hostesses and on air crew. And we were very much interested in the multidimensionality of emotion and in trying to, to discern emotions from people's narratives and understanding the multidimensionality of these type of maybe scripted events or semi-scripted events that happen in, in veterinary um, surgeries and the relationships that vets um, build up with farmers and also with pet owners, which are very, very significant. Um, in a rural place, for example, a vet has a very, very strong um, social function, not only around social status, but also around the types of, of knowledge that the vet has of a particular um, farm or a particular farmer or a particular um, context. So Hopshield's work, for instance, has been really um, valuable to us in giving this initial steer, you know, her definition of emotion as something we do by attending to the sensation in a given way, defining situations and by managing or by giving meaning. Um, and emotions very much is permeable to cultural forces and feelings as clues pertaining to the self-relevance or what we see as acceptable, unacceptable, beautiful, arousing, in, insulting, hurtful, and so forth. So we've been using quite a lot um, of Arlie Huckshield's work 
And even though we have now collected our data and we present it at a couple of different conferences, we're now at the point when we want to start publishing work um, out of this and we've now moved into phase two um, of, the, of the data collection. So it has been a really fascinating process for us. So we started off by looking at some work around emotion and then we started looking really at work from um, veterinary professionals as well and around the, the work, for instance, the, the geographical work or work from people um, like Gareth Endicott in Cardiff University in looking at emotions and relationships and really around the growing recognition as well within the veterinary sciences on the importance of understanding emotions. And we have um, interviewed a few veterinary specialists um, across the US and across Europe as well on the importance of, of emotions in relation um, to the training of, of um, veterinarians um, also. And one of the things that I became really interested in when I was doing the Icon Map project with Connor McAloon and colleagues um, was around the whole idea of the social conventions or the cultural scripts that maybe operate on farms as well. And um, Gareth Endicott and his, his, his PhD supervisor at the time, Frank Fankley, write a lot about these type of cultural scripts, the cultural scripts of farming and the notion of being the good farmer, you know, having the cow that has maybe the shiniest coat or the, the largest amount of weight, particularly weight in particular areas that make um, the, look, the, the cow look like it is more productive or is potentially higher yielding and the sense of social status or cultural capital um, that goes along with that. And the whole idea of relational distancing as well, which comes from Endicott's work, you know, how vets negotiate these different types of distances, not only physical distances, but also social um, or, or cultural differences and distances as well um, with farmers, which I think is, is something as well that is really um, fed into the work. So we were doing some ethnographic work on farms um, prior to COVID-19, but unfortunately we have um, we have had to stop um, that at the moment, and instead we've been we've been doing some phone interviews in recent times um, with farmers and moved on um, to some work that we're also doing uh, with policymakers around the the concept of biosecurity, and also in relation to um, the primacy given to the knowledge of farmers and so forth in in farming um, circles. So obviously within you know, the veterinary sciences and neither Lorraine or I make any claim you know, to be in any way expert um, in this area, but there is an increasing emphasis on the whole idea of reducing stress um, among veterinarians and you know, that the suicide rates among veterinarians are um, particularly high and particularly applicable um, as we saw in the literature in relation to female vets. And I suppose in Icon Map as well from having talked um, to some veterinary specialists, you know, some of the things that would have been mentioned to us would have been things like the working hours, the job involvement, low job satisfaction, which comes up in the literature, relationships, failure to recover money, working conditions, ineffective communication, but there are many, many others. And also the notion of emotional intelligence, you know, although Lorraine would talk a lot more about that and she has um, a lot of issues around that particular um, concept, intellectual issues, in terms of its definition is definitely accorded as well, greater emphasis among um, veterinary um, professionals also. So some of the other things that we started to see, I suppose, as we were progressing with the analysis were some of the other concepts that were important, things like the concept of discourse, the tacit knowledge that's embedded in ways of speaking, ways of working, maybe intonations, movements and so forth. The importance of communicative encounters like drawing on Karen Winter's work from Queens in Belfast these type of, of communicative encounters that happen between um, veterinary professionals and clients. And I suppose in some respects, that might be the beauty of this type of work that when we come at it from very much an interdisciplinary perspective, you know, communicative encounters, Karen Winter is, is, a so, is in social work in Queens. So, you know, not strictly maybe sociology, but actually drawing very closely on, um, on other concepts that are very deeply sociological and also the concept of relational sustainability, which Anya Mack and Walsh and Anne Byrne wrote about in the past, and the kind of social connections, if you want, that, um, that vets have in particular, rural communities in particular. And I suppose one of the other outputs that we have um, also been working on recently 
um, was a, work, a piece of work that we did with Lisa Warwick around ethical considerations in the biographical narrative interpretive method and the whole notion of pushing for pins. So I don't know how many of you here may ever have used BNIM as a particular um, research strategy. And within the context of that paper, which we submitted months ago now to, to qualitative research, and we're waiting for the, the comments to come back, um, one of the things that we talked about was the whole concept of what it means to be at risk and what it means to be vulnerable. Because within um, the context of Lorraine's work as a social worker and within my work as a former postdoc working um, on the lives of, of children that were in the care system for many, many years and talking to their parents and so forth, there is a tendency to, to, to conflate the notion of being at risk or being vulnerable um, with particular groups in society that might be, for example, um, a lone parent or um, a person who has been in care. But one of the things that we, we've talked about within the context of the paper on Benim is the issue around pushing for pins and eliciting stories on people's lives in situations where people on the outside may not actually look vulnerable. They may not be, as we would term, vulnerable or at risk in a sort of traditional sense or traditional or stereotypical viewpoint. But actually, when you go deeper into their narrative, they talk about very um, strong vulnerabilities. And we saw this quite a lot in the, in the VETS project as well, particularly among younger women and among veterinary nurses, um, where, for instance, they would talk often about the social status Many of them talked about being verbally abused at work, um, and this happened both in Ireland and in Britain, but we saw this particularly prevalent in the British context. So this study um, really tried to move across um, context as well, in that we focused on vets in the Republic of Ireland and also in, in Britain. So initially we called this study Vet Life, a qualitative cross-national study um, of veterinarians and emotional labour in the UK and, and Ireland. Um, vet Life is actually a hotline in the UK, a support line um, for vets. So we've now called it Vet Amon, which is short for emotion. And our, our overarching research question was really how do emotions shape and in turn are shaped by, um, um, uh, by everyday relationships between um, veterinarians and animal owners, animal clients, other professionals and their family intimate partners and their own animals. So we were interested in, for instance, you know, how they, they close the door on their job every day, how they manage this type of emotional um, distancing. And I remember very much from when I was doing work with social workers, I would be in social workers' offices when particular phone calls would come in. And, you know, I'd stand outside the door, obviously, but sometimes when I actually heard some, overheard some of the, the, the issues that children were having, my initial reaction would be, oh my God, like if, if I was a social worker, I don't think I would be able to cope with doing this in everyday life. I don't know how I would actually create these boundaries between myself and this young person, you know, to try to help them. But in reality, people have to create boundaries. It is a natural and an ordinary part of life. And through the, the, um, the process of doing these interviews, we've been able to capture some of the boundaries, not all of them, um, obviously, but some of the boundaries um, that people in the veterinary um, profession, or how they create them. So how veterinary professionals define and describe the meanings of emotional boundaries in their lives, how they cope with work-related pressures. So both, for instance, using informal or formal social support, and maybe the evidence of how maybe professional training prefer, prepares them for real life situations. And I remember talking to a vet, for instance, asking them, why are the hours so high for, um, or why are the, the suicide rates, in your opinion, so high for veterinarians? And I remember one woman said to me, well, if you think about it, most of us when we leave college don't know an awful lot about taxation. We have to sometimes file our own tax returns. We're dealing with accountants. Um, you know, we've never dealt with accountants before. Um, we're dealing often with very irate clients. Um, farmers don't want to pay us. Um, and we've come up against that uh, quite a lot, both in Britain and in Ireland in the context of this. There is a steady store of medicine in the back of our car um, at any one time, and it could be dark, and we just don't want to be in these situations. And we had, for instance, 
uh, narratives where vets have told us where they were in physical danger, um, particular um, veterinary nurses, for example, um, that asked pet owners in the UK um, to be for to be to pay for uh, services rendered, um, where bricks were thrown through windows, um, girls were followed home by particular people that were clients, um, and also situations where, in a very extreme case in rural Ireland where a vet described a really harrowing situation where the farmer took a gun out and um, threatened to kill her because if she didn't get off the farm. So she had come to do a particular piece of work. She did the work and she asked for the money and was told no. Um, and it was also nighttime, a very dangerous um, time for any woman to be going out onto a farm. So what we found was that despite a lot of the, ge the geography literature around this, there was some instances of sociological research based around veterinarians lived realities but not so much not as much as what um, we actually thought that there would be and we were really interested in things as i said like euthanasia um, about emotional conflicts and, and ambivalent feelings and also the cultural positionalities of veterinary professionals in relation to animals and also in relation um, to each other so Lorraine, for instance, was really interested in this whole idea of the killing and the caring paradox, and also the whole idea around um, compassion fatigue, around bearing witness to the suffering of others. Um, and we were interested, I suppose, in, in, in mapping a lot of the different um, contexts and contextualizations around this. So this was very much a qualitative case study design um, with veterinarians, veterinary nurses, administrators, veterinary hospitals, and specialist units. Um, involving large-scale clinics, medium, small-scale uh, vets that worked in abattoirs, um, people that worked in in professional pra in commercial practices, rather like um, chains, for example, like uh, Pets for Us, that um, is very very popular in the UK, involving rural and urban locations, specialist clinics, um, for example, those that were involved in equine, um, specialist inventors and surgeons, um, we interviewed a few of those. Um, people that had experience in the RSPCA, the ISPCA and the PDSA, which is a more charity based um, um, animal charity in the UK, and also some teaching staff at veterinary hospitals. Um, we found it at times a little bit challenging um, to find um, participants, particularly ones um, maybe that were specialist inventors and specialist surgeons. We did end up um, with approximately about three of those, I think, in the sample um, at the end. We found that there was good uptake, particularly from, um, from younger veterinarians, um, not so much with, with older groups, but we, we did feel that actually um, another group that we would potentially like to do a project with would be people that were either in training as vets or people that were very new graduates. Um, because there is something around the life of the graduate um, that's very interesting and very important to say around the types of crises and struggles that they often face, face um, on graduation. So this involved narrative style interviews. Um, we used the biographical narrative interpretive method um, with approximately um, three case studies, which um, we're writing up at the moment, uh, very much based around the whole idea of the life course, um, the turning points in people's lives, the turning points in relation to how um, discourse is constructed. We use biographical um, life mapping on a couple of occasions with a couple of participants and also um, ethnography and observation and research, which was something that we were doing just before COVID um, struck. So I'll just take a drink of water, sorry. So some of our tentative findings relate to the notion of emotion as very much multidimensional and as multifaceted and how veterinarians lives are very much interwoven with tacit and explicit knowledge around their professional identities of veterinary as veterinarians which we found was very very strong and also a very strong um, orientation to profit making particularly around people that are working in chains but even those as well that are small businesses and they that might actually seem out of sync or incoherent with the concept of care but in fact, it isn't because the concept of care was one very, very strong finding that we found the whole way through. That no matter who we interviewed, whether they were a veterinary nurse, whether they owned a practice or they worked in a commercial chain, they were committed to animal care and to the whole notion of, um, of being respectful towards animals and took, um, for example, their professional training and their CPD extremely seriously. 
Um, there were serious issues, however, around particularly people working and that owned rural practices around payment. And many of uh, many farmers talked, or vets rather, talked about the problems um, that they often had in terms of maintaining a small business and also being paid. And there seemed to be um, a type of um, script or type of knowledge in particular um, settings where some settings would say particular farmer um, we won't send a particular vet there because um, they don't pay very well or we might try to get out um, of doing that one if possible because payment was um, a serious issue and there was the whole idea as well that pet owners tended to pay a lot better and pay a lot more on time and part of that was possibly to do um, with the, the use value or the perception of the utility of the animal, what the animal um, was actually work, worth. So there were desires for profit making that might be seen as slightly instrumental, but they were also embedded within the notion of care and also real empathy that we saw towards um, participants as well. Um, some veterinary practices, particularly in the UK, were using things like sympathy cards to send out um, to pet owners when the pets died. Now, I had never heard of that in, in Ireland, and certainly I had never seen that happening when my own dogs um, passed away. But in larger practices, I'm told, in urban settings, um, this seems to happen a lot more, but it seems to be something um, that rural vets um, are, not, are, are not doing. Um, we talked, for instance, at uh, particular times to, to owners of pet crematoriums in the UK, and they would talk about um, the, the, the different paraphernalia or the items um, that they sold um, people that came into the pet crematorium. So it might be, for instance, um, that they were uh, commissioning um, small uh, pictures of uh, the animal um, when it was uh, in its prime before it got sick and it would be put in a type of a placard or the price of urns, for example, was something that came up um, quite a lot in conversations as well. But also the real sense of care. I mean, I remember talking to a, an owner of a pet crematorium in the south of England on the phone, and they told me, for instance, that um, on a particular occasion where there was a, a woman who came and told them beforehand that she, she really wanted the dog to be cremated, and the machine was um, ramped up and the dog was about to go into the machine and then she said no that she just couldn't do it couldn't go through with it and the amount of time that the nurse actually spent sitting down um with the the pet owner um that day so the the whole idea of instrumentality and care lorraine and i went into this to some degree wondering to what extent instrumentality and care would be balanced but um actually they they were often quite balanced in people's um, opinions and I guess it's just to do often with the multi-dimensionality of people's narratives and something for instance I was talking about this morning to a group of students in the UK via the internet was the notion of human intimacy and how the notion of intimacy and care are both multi-dimensional they're almost like balls of wool that are so entangled and sometimes they converge and sometimes uh, it's almost like pulling um, bits of wool out and sometimes they're they're quite um, united as well in terms of how um, people talk about them. So we succeeded in getting some really interesting data. Um, euthanasia, particularly for um, the vets that were starting out, um, seemed to be an issue. Um, we did have two or three trainee vets actually as well. And for the trainees, um, some of them found this quite hard. But most people that were interviewed when they talked about euthanasia um, talked about the, the professional practice and the professional training as well in relation to this. Um, and we had one woman, for example, um, who worked in an abattoir who talked, for instance, about the difficulties that she had in euthanizing um, at the very beginning. And then she said it was something that she very much um, got used to. And also that the whole idea of animal care was key to this and wanting to be careful and um, empathetic um, towards the um, towards the owners, which she did talk as well about the whole idea of using scripts. That at the very beginning, that she would write down the different um, the different points in um, bullet point format, and she would use this as a guide whenever she um, was talking to um, pet owners about putting the animal down. And this wasn't only just I think used as a form of management. It was more around the idea that 
she she felt that she had a duty of care towards the animal and towards the the owner and she wanted to do the the euthanizing um correctly you know so euthanization or euthanizing animals when it goes wrong can be very difficult and is a very difficult situation for the vet and also for the pet owner um, and there have been situations where pet owners and vets talked about this where they felt that they did something wrong and it might be that they felt that they could have given more care or shown more empathy um, to the pet owner um, but it could also um, have been um, something clinical as well that happened. So we found that also some vets um, adopted different practices towards animals like we had one lady that talked about the river of death and this notion of the river of death is on about a page and a half of her entire narrative when she talks about the work placement that she did at an abattoir and that she became vegan after that, that she, she saw all of these slaughtered pigs and dead pigs in, in some kind of vat of water and she called it the river of death and hated going to the abattoir um, every day. There was also a veterinary nurse that had worked um, for charitable organisations in the UK. She talked a lot about the status driven um, nature um, of veterinary practice and she used to call the week before Christmas the week of death when lots of healthy dogs and cats were brought in um, to be um, euthanized. But she talked about the process of, um, of getting on with it. Um, but I suppose as a pet owner, I was shocked when I started reading you know, the, the narrative and hearing the narrative um, that they didn't want the older animals you know, digging up their carpets um, over Christmas and they got new pets instead. You know, and this whole idea of the instrumentality, get rid of the older animal and um, and get the, the new animal in. Um, so we also talked to some um, veterinary inspectors um, as well. Um, I can't see this uh, slide too well. Um, oh yeah, okay. So there was often sometimes as well the difference between the, the rights of the human and um, the rights of the animal. So for instance, in some situations, um, the, the, there was disagreement between vets um, in a very small number of cases in relation um, to euthanizing um, an animal. And one particular situation emerged when someone talked about this in the UK, not in the Irish context, um, where there was a practice, very small practice um, with two vets. And there was one farmer, for instance, that they used to go to that was known as particularly um, cruel to his animals. And in some, in one particular situation, a vet wanted to put a dog down because he felt that the dog had been neglected over a long period of time. And what was unusual was that when the, um, the vet talked to the farmer, felt that the, the dog wasn't going to do any good and the farmer had withheld payment on a number of occasions, that actually um, the farmer started talking about the huge depression that they would feel in the house if the animal was gone. And so there was this trade-off between someone who was supposed to be horrendously cruel um, to their animals and neglectful, particularly of their dogs and cats, because again, the utility or the use value um, of, the, of the animal um, wasn't as high um, when it was a cat or a dog compared to, um, to an animal that they would have been selling on. And very the farmers that we interviewed um, corresponding to other literature very much talked about the use value in relation to the productivity and the economic um, productivity um, of the animal as well. So status was also a very key thing, particularly for the younger vets. Um, we had a couple of younger vets that had worked in the UK for a period of time and moved back to Ireland and talked about the real status driven nature of it, um, particularly in the UK. When they came back to Ireland, funnily enough, they found the rural practices tended to be a lot more relaxed and a lot less status driven in the UK. They talked about the, the entrenchment of these different types of statuses. Um, so, for instance, there was one um, woman who worked for the PDSA in Britain and she'd also worked in other practices in the UK and then came back to Ireland. So she said she remembers seeing vets really angry and berating younger vets and veterinary nurses and they were in tears and throwing things across the room and this came up on more than one occasion and saying to the nurse um, to pick it up that status was such a big thing you know that they they were in control and essentially you do this because i tell you that you can do it and on some occasions we had one nurse or, or uh, one nurse and one vet 
um, that talked about loving the job and loving the work that they did in the UK and having a really strong relationship with the farmers and the pet owners, but that the problem essentially was that they could not deal with the status driven um, issues. And gender was also something that emerged and this emerged quite a lot um, among um, younger vets. So we also had um, a situation where there was an, a veterinary nurse um, that told us about a particular practice that she had worked in. Um, it was quite a prominent um, UK practice um, and that it was also a very, very um, big practice. And she talked about, for instance, she remembered that a nurse was asked by a vet that she put an animal um, down at night. So legally a vet had to be present um, to do this. Um, but it caused a huge, um, a huge argument on the phone because this particular vet who owned the surgery did not want to come in. Um, eventually he came in, but it was nighttime and he made life very, very difficult for her afterwards and it caused a lot of resentment. And eventually that nurse um, exited um, that practice um, because things had become um, so bad. And uh, this, another example of the, the pick it up examples, as I would call them, emerges later on. So respectful silences were key around managing emotions and in giving um, pet owners and farmers as well, to some extent, time to process and manage their emotions. So a male vet, for instance, in a rural clinic in Ireland said, like, I just keep it minimal because they don't need a lot of kind words. If they've made the decision to put the animal down, they didn't do it overnight. So I remain silent for a while. And the same when I'm putting the animal down, I don't say very much, even if the, the owner um, happens to be there. Um, we, we saw this less within the UK, this whole idea of giving space and giving um, silence. Um, we saw this less within commercial practices. This tended to be more in the Irish um, context and also in, um, in rural um, settings um, as well. So one vet, for instance, in a rural practice who trained in the UK, incidentally, and works in Ireland now, talked about it as a type of script that they learned it in college. Um, I learned it because I don't want to make a mess of it. The animal can be in pain. It's not good. There's a script of procedures. I usually bring them to the room and give them time with their pet. Now, incidentally, they, she also had um, an issue with uh, bringing up money. And the, the kind of almost instrumental um, part of it came in at the very end um, of this narration when she talked about the problems of bringing money up at the very end. So she and the veterinary nurse had decided that at the very beginning, money would be talked about before um, the euth euthanizing event um, actually took place so that they were paid in advance or if they weren't paid in advance, that they would be paid at the very end because in some situations they found it very hard to break um, the news of the money or to talk about uh, money afterwards. And money is a key um, part of it as well. So we had situations where there was a lot of um, mental health issues among some of the farmers that we talked to that were actually quite open with us, which we were surprised about um, in terms of loneliness, in terms of feeling isolated, in terms of, in a couple of occasions, talking about clinical depression and their experiences of being depressed and that wasn't only in Ireland, incidentally, but also um, within the UK as well. And I suppose youth in one of the, the kind of key themes that we saw across um, both countries was the notion of welfare. You know, that all of these vets, to some degree that we interviewed, talked a lot about welfare, even the ones that would, one for, we, we only had one that said, in reality, I care about the money more than the animal. Um, I don't really care about the animals anymore because I've made quite a lot of money out of my practice. And that only happened in one situation and it was in um, the UK. So one of the things I suppose that we're really interested in is looking at the differences between the UK model, which is markedly different and is based a lot around commercial practices versus the small kind of um, rural practice as well in Ireland. And some veterinarians said the only time that they ever regret it um, helping an animal, they never regretted putting one down, but they regretted um, helping one where they, they sent an animal or they were part of the referral process of an animal going to the USA for specialist treatment and later said, I'm sorry I wrote the letter because it was the dog's life was a misery for the last few months of their life. 
So this next quotation, and I suppose I said it before in many ways, um, it's around the whole idea of the instrumentality and um, the, the profit making um, within the context of the larger UK um, commercial um, based uh, veterinary insurgents. Um, we would see, for instance, this a little bit more where um, nurses and people that have worked in commercial practice and, and vets that have worked in commercial practices and then maybe transferred to a more rural setting or to a smaller um, practice talked about how the larger practices, um, not all of them, but some of them um, were often very much based around a more managerialist based, profit bid, uh, driven, instrumental um, based um, model around um, making money. And this was very much, I suppose, in contrast, if you want, to some of the more rural based ones that I went to in the west of Ireland, where I had one vet that said simple is best. And this man had several members of his family had also um, trained as vets. And he said they would come home at the weekends and they would talk about, you know, the large amount of prescriptions and the large amount of of medication that they had prescribed for particular animals as well with different situations. And this man owned his own practice for several years and he had come up, um, I suppose, with kind of um, more, how would I say, treatments that were more based on tacit knowledge or on everyday experiential knowledge um, with animals. And he felt that, you know, in some situations that vets and veterinary practices had actually pursued money more than they had um, the care of the animal, but care, that was not something that we saw um, regularly. You know, this one here, for example, is around the whole idea of pursuit of profit. We didn't see this often, and we saw this more certainly um, in the UK. The memorial cards for animals was something I had only seen in Britain at the time uh, when we did this, but apparently I'm, I'm seeing this a lot more um, now. And we talked to the person who, who was in charge of the memorial cards for the pets in the UK and like the secretary would write them and she'd write things like he was a great boy, he had a great life, we loved him so much. And the owner thinks that it was good for, for business, but actually some of these uh, the people that worked in the, um, in the clinic defined themselves as being atheists and having absolutely no interest in, um, in life after death. Um, and the secretary felt that this was actually a waste of time, that regardless of um, profitability or, you know, keeping um, for the sustainability of the business uh, to keep um, people coming back. Um, you know, she used to find at times that it was laborious work on top of all of the other things that she had to do. And that sometimes she and some of the other vets in the practice would struggle to write anything um, about a particular um, about a particular animal. And so they would use a script like he was a great boy or she was a great girl um, without even having maybe seen the animal more than once or twice. So repeat business um, was really key. We found that sometimes um, most of the vets that we interviewed were very good at managing their emotions and keeping the professional professional and the personal um, personal. We had some situations where um, some very small number of people said that it did um, affect their relationship um, that they had with their intimate partners um, and that they had bonded more uh, with some of the animals that they had saved from being put down and they brought them home. Now that's not necessarily because they had saved them, but it might be um, a relationship that maybe there was something in the relationship um, with the intimate partner that maybe um, was already um, going a little bit sour. We don't know. Um, we were only told what we were told using this type of methodology. <clears throat> and we had one woman, a female vet, who said that her family called her the ice queen, uh, maybe because all my emotions um, go into this work. And she talked about the whole idea of how draining it was setting up um, her own business and in managing um, the business as well. Um, so there were some situations, I suppose, just to finish up um, soon, because I'm sure you're tired of me um, talking by now, um, where nurses and, and vets had also got um, very upset um, about particular cases that had, had come in where owners had wanted and had requested them um, to put particular um, animals down and they felt that there was no need for this, that it was a healthy animal. And when I asked one vet, for instance, about the regrets, did they, did they ever regret anything in their lives? And one vet said to me, the only thing I ever regret was that when I was uh, young and starting out, um, a pet owner um, came in 
and had an animal with them that they said um, had bit someone at home and that they wanted the dog to be put down. And they kept the dog in the veterinary practice uh, for a day or two, found the dog extremely placid, and um, they went and eventually put the dog down. Um, and that was the biggest regret that they had in their um, career. But there were other cases as well where nurses and vets um, had saved dogs from being um, euthanized and took them home and looked after them. And in some one situation, I remember going into a house where there was a veterinary nurse and um, this beautiful dog lying in front of the fire that she had saved um, from being euthanized um, in the, the practice that she was in in the UK as well. Um, so this next slide was around something that we, we talked about, the connection um, with animals. But when we write the papers, we, you, you'll see um, more of them about the whole idea of acting with the highest integrity, regardless how you feel about the animal um, yourself. So just some concluding thoughts, because I talked for ages now, um, is that the sociological research on vets and professionals is developing, but it's developing um, quite slowly. And there, but there is a lot of work um, other applied work out there within um, social work, even using Karen Winter's work that was useful here, um, but more broadly, I suppose, within um, the sociology of emotions and within um, um, geography, uh, human geography, that provides a lot of insights or more detailed insights into emotions of work and home. Um, some of the things that we've been exploring and that we're continuing to explore really with this are the relationships with human clients and communication around death and euthanasia, which are all really interesting um, in themselves and something that our subsequent papers um, are going to um, form. So our tentative evidence, and this is very tentative because we've conducted one round of analysis, one round of interviews, um, and we're now into the second round, which is um, with policymakers and with Brexit and COVID-19 that has yielded um, its own problems and its own issues in terms of um, getting a good sample. Um, it shows the importance of power um, and also for scripts um, for communication and the importance of understanding um, emotions in practice. And just to say that the study is funded by the Research Investment Fund at Edgehill University in Barnskirk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Uh, first question here from uh, Kevin Denny. Uh, is there much of a difference between the experience of vets dealing with pets and with farm animals? Um, that's a really good question. Um, thanks very much. Uh, yes, um, yes, in some ways there is. There's, very diff there's a lot of differences between um, pet owners as clients and also um, farmers as clients. And vets, like, like all social actors, I suppose, react to the particular um, context um, that they're in. The, um, the pet owners, uh, the, the vets that deal mainly with pets, would some of them started off in the sample that we had, um, they started off working um, with farmers and then diversified um, into working primarily with pets and have often talked about this as a much more, I suppose, lucrative um, business because they feel, for instance, that there is a higher um, likelihood um, that they're going to get paid at the end of the week and that actually um, that they can tend to make um, more money um, out of this. Um, I suppose in relation to the, the attitudes maybe that they have um, towards animals, the vets that we interviewed that would work quite a lot with farmers and farm animals, I suppose, would be a lot more cognizant or very, very cognizant of the instrumentality and the profitability of that animal and how that animal might perform in a marked situation. And I suppose because I'm from a rural community myself, it's something that I would be very cognizant of when talking to farmers in terms of gaining access around the notion of talking the language of the farmer around profitability and around talking about things like net yield and milk yield and so forth. Um, the biggest difference that we found was in relation to equine. Um, not so much pets or uh, vets that dealt with pets and um, vets that deal with farmers. And part of that was because in our sample, several of the vets that we talked to that were now um, pet vets had started off um, working in farming practice. But in equine, we found that the hierarchies tended to be even a lot more solidified than they were in relation to those that dealt with pets 
and those that dealt with farm animals in terms of how the clinics were organized. And we also found as well, probably again to do with money, um, and that we were we were interviewing people um, that were working in practices where they were dealing with specialist breeds um, of horses. They were trading in an awful lot more money, and there were a lot of things like reputations um, that tended to be on the line. In our sample, interestingly enough, most of the pet vets that we talked to tended to be female. Um, that might again, in some respects, to the fact that most of the pet vets we talked to in this sample um, were also in the UK. In the Irish context, there tended to be a higher transference from people who had worked initially with um, farmers and that they had went strictly into um, pets within the UK, probably because it's more industrialized um, and agriculture in, in some of the cities, you know, wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be a major player in terms of, of the economy. Um, so a lot of them were, were urban based pet vets, but the, the biggest difference bet was between the equine and everybody else. Um, the statuses tend to be more marked. Okay, thank you for that comprehensive answer, Lisa. Uh, our next question comes from Philip O'Connell, the director of the Geary Institute for Public Policy. He says, uh, thank you, Lisa, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, do training programs for future vets cover mental health and well-being? Um, yes, yeah, I think that's um, a really interesting question. Um, it's really good, actually, how UCD and the vet school in UCD um, are actually using actors, I believe, or have been using actors um, in terms of, of veterinary training um, with, uh, with trainee vets around managing emotions and also how to deal um, with farmers and also with pet owners in different situations. So how do you deal, for example, with a pet owner who maybe starts to, to cry? Um, or how do you deal with a farmer who's maybe um, more irate? Um, in some of the, the veterinary schools, in the UK and also in the, the US. And I suppose these are more fresh in my mind um, because I, I talked to some of the, the professors recently um, that were working um, there as well. Their, their emotions tends to be built in um, within the training, but in some situations, it, there's more of an emphasis on um, the concept of emotion and intelligence rather than how we would understand emotions as very much fluid, as very much contextual and multidimensional. So I suppose it's not only just that the training is there, but it's also around how the training is delivered. And a lot of that comes back to the notion of um, what emotion is and how the um, conceptualization of emotion um, is deployed um, in that context. Okay, thank you. Uh... Okay, uh, another question from Karen Dunn. Thank you, Lisa, very interesting. And you've reminded me uh, why I no longer work in practice. I now train veterinary nurses and wonder if you have any advice for what might help them navigate some of these challenges. Um, I think that's um, a really interesting question, um, Karen. And I'm sorry to hear in some respects that you don't work in practice and, anymore. And I hope that you're happier um, in your new job. Um, far be it from me to, to offer um, any advice or recommendations um, to a vet in terms of how they would do their job or to someone who's, who's training veterinarians um, or veterinary nurses. But I think raising awareness, um, Karen, is really, really key, um, not just among veterinary nurses, but also among veterinary graduates not, um, about the importance of self-awareness and the importance of... Um, of shared working and mindfulness probably towards, towards others. Um, but I think potentially there, there, there is something I think that we have to do um, within this. Uh, probably more interviews are needed, I think, in terms um, of veterinary hospital uh, staff and also around, um, around the training element. But I think that's, that's an excellent question and it is something that, um, that has been in my mind recently as well. I'm sorry, I can't give a more comprehensive answer to that one. Okay, um, well, the question from me following on from Karen's question is, had you thought at any stage about interviewing vets or veterinary nurses who have exited the, the veterinary field? Yes, yeah, and we have interviewed um, a couple of them actually, um, Darren. Um, so I'm thinking of uh, two women, for example, who are now academics, not in the veterinary field um, at all. Um, uh -huh started off as veterinary nurses um, and diversified with their careers. 
And one of them in particular, very similar to what you've been, um, you were saying there as well, um, Karen, um, talked about how she was so glad that she wasn't in practice. And as hard as the struggles have been in academia in terms of zero hour contracts and um, finding permanent posts and finding a permanent job and being a, a jobbing researcher from place to place, um, you know, she talked a lot about um, the status hierarchies and you know, getting up at one stage in the middle of the night and crying because she felt so disrespected in her work and in her job um, by senior colleagues. And at one point in time, the gender element is really significant as well in this. Um, at one point in time, was the only female member of staff um, and talked quite a lot about the, the, the sense that she was being shunned by older staff members and also by male staff members and how difficult it was to negotiate her position and to be seen as a legitimate person within that situation. And eventually she just said, one day I just gave up and I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. Um, so yeah, he's now working in academia as a jobbing researcher. Okay, thank you. Um, and then kind of maybe following on from that, uh, with, in your introduction to your seminar, you were talking about uh, being interested in the life course and biographical approach. And I'm just wondering if, some of the younger vets, uh, a coping strategy as they develop in their career and become older is, um, um, I don't know quite the phrase to use, as um, they become maybe slightly more jaded yep. in their approach as, as, a, as a way of coping. And I'm, I, so I'm just wondering, is this, is this just a very typical life course trajectory that you're witnessing? Yeah, in some respects, I think people do become jaded over time. Um, they become worn down, but I think they also become used to the conditions, um, particularly the conditions around euthanasia. Um, so, for instance, some of the, the, the younger vets, you know, struggled with this when they first qualified or they felt that they had struggled with it as they were training. But certainly as the, the older vets, one of the things that we did notice was the whole thing around boundaries and managing boundaries, you know, they talked about this, that they were much better at it, that it was something that they had learned over time as a kind of professional socialization. But it was interesting as well how the older vets often talked about the younger vets and said, actually, when I was starting out, I felt that I was on call all the time. And now with the younger vets, that they actually have a much deeper understanding um, of time management and about family time, and that they were much more rigorous in terms of how they made and maintain these boundaries um, across time. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, okay, let me just check, we have another question has come in here. Uh, this is a question from, um, from Mark Dalton, uh, a comment more than a question. The attrition rate in the profession is absolutely staggering. Uh, yes. Frustration uh, is a big factor. If you just want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that's something that, um, yeah, we, um, we have seen right across um, the board in terms of the, the people that we've, we've interviewed. And we've had several situations, I suppose we explore this a lot more in the, in the paper that we've, we've submitted to qualitative research. Um, we've had several situations where vets have sat down and um, they've put their head in their hands and they've cried for long periods of time. And I remember particularly harrowing interview, and there was obviously issues around research or self-care as well, in relation to hearing harrowing narratives um, where we talked about or we talked to a female vet um, in based in the UK who had talked about several suicide attempts when she was training to be a vet um, and did qualify as a vet and um, exited the profession. She was someone as well actually that had um, exited because she just couldn't cope with it um, and felt and that wasn't just uh, to do with, you know, euthanizing animals or, or anything like that. She just felt that she just um, couldn't cope with the pressure. She couldn't cope with the strain. Um, as hard as the pressure was when she was in uh, training, when she was in practice, it was um, a lot worse and felt that she um, was unfairly treated because she was a woman um, and that she had been sent out in very tough cases, often in the middle of the night um, to farms um, when um, her colleagues, her male colleagues were supposed to be on call and um, she was the one that ended up being called upon. So it was uh, a very, very difficult situation. And, you know, there are particular um, types of, 
of ethical safeguards that you can put in place. And I suppose some of the work that the European Sociological Association and I are doing is in relation to the role of technology that obviously we're in a very difficult COVID situation at the moment and many people's research has had to stop. And that's been a very difficult situation for a lot of people to be in, but whether or not, what can you do? What kind of safeguards can you put in place? Or could I have put in place if I had interviewed that vet um, over video link? You know, so you're not only socially distanced, but you're physically distant as well. Um, so there are a lot of unresolved issues, I think, even for qualitative researchers around this, what this new technology and this new interviewing situation means for people on an ethical level. Okay, interesting. Finally, I just have, uh, we just have time briefly for one last uh, question. Uh, so another question from Kevin Denny. Uh, I wonder if there's any way of comparing uh, comparing burnout between veterinary nurses and regular brackets human nurses. Uh, yes, yeah, it would be um, it would be uh, really really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I did some work on um, psychiatric nurses a number of years ago. I had a master's student um, that was in NUI Galway who did a master's in family support, and she was uh, practicing. Um, she was uh, working in a, in a facility at the time with the HSE where there were um, psychiatric nurses and burnout um, was something that was very, very um, regular. My understanding from looking at that work, and obviously that's very different and it's not, it's like comparing in some respects apples and oranges um, to some degree. Um, so comparisons, um, you know, it, it's kind of difficult in some ways to make them, but my understanding from that situation is that it was workload. Um, Geraldine Fahey and I found that workload was was key in this and also managing um, people that were psychologically quite unwell and managing um, restraining people was was a big issue for psychiatric nurses. But this seemed to be different with the veterinary nurses. This seemed often to be based around um, status and power relations that operated in these settings. Um, we didn't see power relations as much, or definitely not in the work with psychiatric nurses. Um, but yes, it would be fascinating actually um, to do that. Okay. And particularly in COVID-19, I think as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, unfortunately, Lisa, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you for a really enlightening presentation today. We're thank looking you. forward to seeing more of the fruits of, of, your, of your research. Thank you. And um, um, I hope we, in the future we'll get to meet up again in person. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and if thank, you very, thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Thank you. And if there's anybody that would like to make contact about the project, my email is lisa.moran at edgehill.ac.uk. So um, there were some insightful and fascinating comments and questions there. So um, Lorraine and I would be privileged um, to speak to some of you. Okay, I, I took notes of uh, some of the questions there, and there's a few other questions and comments I had that I didn't get time to address, so I'll okay. drop them to you in an email, okay? Thank you.